Yeah, she just like spews our artistic talent <laughs> in every movement. I'm always watching. What a treat! Thank you. We have so many treats already. You two are showing. Take try and take notes. <laughs> I know. I call them the power, the, the power couples. Yeah, we were called that before by by the uh, art gallery, uh, the, the woman that runs our art center. There's a few power couples here. Yeah, she's here's the power couple. Yeah, it's cool right now. I think people are the best when they it's have that school of Alabama. What's the name of that? Yeah. That art center? Well, just contact me. You know, it's the best full center for the arts. Because I'm going to come up in a couple months. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, definitely get in touch with us. Do you, you have my business card? Or? Okay. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. So, have we received a stock to the show? Stock to the show, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have anything planned? <laughs> <laughs> What a person uh, to ask. Yes, right. <laughs> to um, talk about poetry. Yes. Uh, I guess that's really uh, what we've come to do is talk about poetry. And I know there are at least some other people here who also have written poems and poetry and published. I do want to talk about how we met. Yes, we met in a poetry salon. Yes. Uh, this so. was almost <laughs> five years ago. <laughs> Four and three quarters. Oh. Uh, I'm always more accurate. Um, but but um, so that it's going to go sort of into how poetry has changed my life. Like just taking a path and following it, and amazing things can happen if you're on the right path. And so this particular snippet of the path was uh, there's a man named uh, Larry Robinson who hosts a poetry uh, poem a day. Anyone could join the poem a day. And I found out about it a long time ago. He also does a poetry salon where he has like 45 people at either his home or someone else's home. And it's based on, on the um, uh, oral tradition. So whether you... Which is the, the one requirement is if you're going to recite poetry, you recite poetry. There's no reading poetry. Mm -hmm. in this, uh, There's what? No reading. There's no reading. Oh. You recite. You say it from memory. Oh. And it's honoring that oral tradition. Mm -hmm. So I would always, I, I went with a friend, Shepard, and, and um, he would always bring me in. You had to sign up ahead of time. Like the day it was announced, you had to sign up because it filled right away. And then I started going on my own, and but meeting Shepard there. But, but this man, Shepard, I always had the idea that he would introduce me to the guy I was supposed to be with, even when I was with someone else. Um, <laughs> uh, so Shepard and I had been, been friends for a long time. Anyway, this time he said he's bringing a friend of his, and I said, um, he said he was a, a retired psychiatrist just recently out of a relationship. So I asked, how old is he? That was my only question. And Shepard said, I don't know, he's younger than him. So I said, okay. So we went, and, there was, and I knew this was my guy, because <laughs> I, I knew. I mean, I wish. Well, the initial the pre reaction, the pre reaction was, I'm going to go now to meet the, the guy I'm going to. I used to say marry, but then I didn't want to tell him that, so I'd say, the man I was supposed to be with. Now I can say, man, I'm supposed to marry. So, um, and so when I walked in, it's like I, I was actually all dressed up because I had an art opening that same day, and and I'm looking around trying to figure out who is this guy because he wasn't sitting next to Shepard. And Judith knows Shepard. Um, and I meet John ahead of me. I was there that night. You were there that night. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, so I see John sitting uh, across, and I'm thinking, here's this guy with his cap and his dark glasses, and it's like, uh, he's not really my, my type. You know, so. I, think, I think what you said before was him. <laughs> 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 And then this was, I, I said earlier at this conference, there were two times I trusted. And, and yeah, so I, no, I, I, I said to God, I said, really? And, and the reply was trust. And that was it. I've been going on trust ever since. And, um, How did you happen to be there, John? Because of Shepard. And uh, ah. I also knew Larry. I'm on Larry's mailing list. I get a poem every day in my email box. Uh -huh. Shepard uh, invited me to also come and 
show up. Aptly named. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That night I was Shepherd's guest and you went on your own. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. But I was okay. next to Shepherd and you were so. in the house at the next door. Yes. And of course John's also a poet. So um, so that's how we met. So poetry and I'm bringing that in to like like really following a path when I never thought I'd be a poet. I am not a trained poet. I did not go to school for this. And um, just took it on. As Yes, I did. Yeah. Yes. So um, I had recently broken up with uh, a gentleman I was dating for eight to ten years. It's hard to say because the breakup took two years. <laughs> um, but um, I had wrote, written a poem. I was taking a class with um, uh, Jane Hirschfield. Mm -hmm. And it was an amazing yeah. class. And for a long time, I didn't study poetry at all. I just wanted to do my own thing and see what would happen. But I did take a class on Jane Hirschfield, and it was two days after the election in 2016 when Trump won. She won and we all came time. in there crying. Mm -hmm. And she it's held us in this magnificent space. Um, there were probably 100 people there. And she did her Dharma talk every day, and people were writing poems. And nothing came out for me. And then all of a sudden, it was like the last day, this poem came in. It was called um, My Journal, The Journal, or just called Journal. Uh, and it was about writing in my journal about all the wrong things. I always wrote about the bad stuff. I never wrote about the good. And and so that was what, what the poem was about. And... and uh, and there, so, so it was a poem about breaking up with, with my my ex. And then there was a time during the poem. Because you, you wanted me to know that you were single. I, I, yeah. Right? I, it was an advertisement poem. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I remember listening to this. Of course, that message was like, <laughs> I didn't get that. Speak next to Shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> Can you read that poem? You know, I don't have it. It's not in this book. It's not in this book. Oh. Um, and I don't think we have it anywhere yeah. online. Um, but I came up. I shook, yeah. I shook your hand. I knew. The Sorry moment about that. I shook your hand. The mm -hmm. way you shook my hand. Yeah. Uh, and I, <laughs> you know, as, as a man. Uh, yes, of course. There's, there's a lot in that. Mm -hmm. and her handshake was present. It was solid. It wasn't aggressive at all. It was, and it wasn't yielding at the same time. It was, it was an impressive combination of things in your handshake that I knew. Mm. I knew. So he read my handshake and I read his handwriting. Because so, <laughs> he wrote me a letter soon after that because he wanted to buy my book and he had no cash on him. And Shepard said you could trust him. Mm -hmm. So then he had to write me a check and wrote mm -hmm. a letter and he wrote with it. So um, mm -hmm. anyway, that was the beginning of <laughs> the well, I'll, I'll read the poem that I read that that oh. recited that night. Mm -hmm. Not that this plays into the story at all, but <laughs> um, the poem I wrote, uh, the poem I read was called Siren. In your latest writing, mm -hmm. Silence. Mm -hmm. So, sirens. What exactly did the sirens sing? Hello, boys. Come on back. We're told that it meant crashing the ship off so offshore. But is this true? What would the sirens say? They made so many promises. 
so tied to the mass, were they expressing their heart's desires, unimaginable sound, a chorus of ocean? Probably. But the ship sailed on back. So, everyone loves the sun. So warm, so dry. Almost time now to go home underwater. <laughs> oh, nice. How about reading it a second time? Mm -hmm. yeah. I like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Give, give me 10 seconds, Joe. I need to get this set up before you do that masterful reading. This poem is typical of, of, of a number of very interesting in the old stories. It might be a biblical story, it might be Greek mythology, it might be some other parallel mythological tale. Um, and I like to take those stories and turn them. Uh, these things are so at the core of who and what we are in the Western culture and in a way they kind of lock us in to the roles that we play or the way the things that we think or the relationships in our life. I like to change them or show them from the other perspectives. You know, we typically hear the story from the point of view of uh, Ulysses, right? Who all of his men are, uh, you know, have plugs in their ears so they can't hear the sirens. He ties, he has himself tied to the mast so he can't hear the sirens sing and respond. A um, person that's often forgotten is Orpheus who is on the boat, um, and we're not told that probably his ears are plugged as well, but we don't hear his music, we hear the music of the sirens in this book. Um, I'll wait for Tim just for a second. Oh, so we're skipping it. Um, we're skipping it. Yeah, sorry, I'm mm -hmm. fiddling with the camera. So while we're at it, this is John's book. It was published just a few days ago. So this is hot off the press. It has 22 poems in it. John took the photo and I designed yeah, the she, book. She designed it and, and did a great it's, job. It's full of some really lovely, lovely poems. Yeah. Nice. All right, now you can go. New enough that uh, I ordered the books and had them shipped here. <laughs> <laughs> and I really liked it that you explained the poem. I got that added in the mention. Mm. So this is called Sirens. What exactly did <laughs> the sirens sing? Hello, boys. Come on back. We are told it meant crashing the ship offshore. But is this true? What would the sirens say? They made so many promises, so tied to the mast. Were they expressing their heart's desires, unimaginable sound, a chorus of ocean? Probably. But the ship sailed on glass. So, everyone loved the sun, so warm, so dry. Almost time now to go home underwater. Okay. There's another uh, element in this that shows up in some of my poems, which is, is underwater, breathing underwater, living underwater. Um, when I went through analysis, this was a theme. Uh, I would find myself with a, a female companion swimming, breathing underwater, exploring, looking up things. And, uh, so it, uh, it comes up time and again, mm -hmm. this time from the point of view of the sun. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. How about, uh, may, do people know who we are? Do we uh, have to say anything about that? I always have to check. Well, I think everyone here knows, but it is being broadcast. Uh -huh. um, 
This says that I'm a retired psychiatrist and deaf psychotherapist. Does that one award me for what? It says that I was once the chair of the Newman Center for Spirituality and the Arts, and Judith was on that board. Oh, man. Um, yeah. But that was a... It was sponsored by uh, the Episcopal Church in Santa Rosa, uh, along the lines of the church being a patron of the arts. And this confluence is not out of character with regard to the types of things that Newman and I used to do, put on productions, put on uh, programs uh, of all different types. Um, I currently facilitate the Rainer Maria Rilke Reading Group, sponsored by the Friends of the Young Institute of San Francisco, and Judith sometimes comes. Terry and I are both members. Tim and uh, Skip are both uh, members. Is that all? Yeah, I think so. Uh, we've been reading uh, Daniel Polakoff's biography of Rilke, which is a soul journey. Uh, I also teach about Rilke. I have a 10-lecture course. I also have a 10-lecture course on the psychological approach to the Old Testament. Um, this series is uh, along the lines of Eric Neumann, actually, more than Jung, per se. Um, very in interested in this, the symbolic issue of these stories. Um, but, you know, in the Jungian world, in the Western world, and this is one of the reasons, I think, that Jung says, that we, you, you know, in Edinger, of course, is very adamant about you have to understand the Christian story, the Christian myth. It's in your soul, it's in your psyche if you were raised in the Western world. Uh, people like Eric Neumann took exception to that. He's Jewish. Uh, he uh, went to live in Israel uh, after the war. Um, and so I, in this Old Testament series, ignored the New Testament part of it and went back to the Old Testament stories and tried to understand, get, to get to the roots of who were these ancient Hebrews, what were these stories that they told, and um, what can we take away from these stories, how do they speak to our souls. Um, I felt it was a very different kind of journey, a very different psychology than the one that we typically see um, here in the West. Um, and I also teach a shorter course, I just got hired at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute Sonoma State University. Mm. How about yourself? What does your book say who you are? <laughs> <laughs> Let us look. On top of the ground. Actually, I'm not going to read it. <laughs> um, but I will say who I am. Um, my background's in art, in painting, in calligraphy. So I've been doing calligraphy since I was 16. And, and it's been interesting the way I've, I've come to poetry because I, I'm a trained calligrapher. I studied with all the great masters in, in the West. And I, there's sort of this lineage, and you learn how to do it this way and that way. And then as you progress, you need to lead the teachings. It's always, you know, make it, make it your own. And when I started writing poetry, and this is actually the second round of writing poetry, I wrote poetry when I was 16 to 20, and I would write greeting cards for everyone I knew. And I also did little booklets. I, I would illustrate them, and, and my, my parents saved some of them, so I still have some. But I still remember some of the poems. I have a book of 50 poems I wrote between the age of 16 and 20. Mm -hmm. And I knew the poetry was important. And, you know, where the art has gone out to whatever um, card, whoever received the card, I always wrote down the poem. And, in fact, I saved my first, one of my first poems from the fourth grade. So uh, it was something like I, I always knew poetry was important. But then I stopped writing in my 20s when my life took a different turn. And it wasn't until uh, 2007 when I was in a, a new relationship. And, um, and we, we actually met online, but we also we had a few dates. And then he wrote me a poem. Oh, and I didn't even read that one, and I don't have one either. Uh, he wrote me a poem, and I wrote him back one, and we started this poetry conversation where it was completely separate from our phone calls, completely separate from our emails, and completely separate from our dates in person. It was like it had its own life. 
Mm-hmm. And, and we eventually published, not eventually, but in two months. We, so the first two months of our relationship, we had these beautiful poems back and forth. And then I put them all to calligraphy, which was much more of my old style of where every word was in each painting. And, and it was called Two as One, and that book is available on my website. And my website is Art and Poetry, A-N-D. Um, and, and so anyway, I started writing poetry back and forth. But then after, as I say, like, like the flurry of new love wasn't there anymore. I mean, we still dated for a long time, but, but we weren't writing those poems anymore. I got hooked on poetry. And because I loved the ease of how it would come, and it would come any time. Like my, my deal with the poet in the sky was that whenever a poem would come, I would stop whatever I was doing and write it down. So I'm driving and writing down a poem or jumping out of the shower to write a poem. And I wanted to continue in a little more contained way. So I set up a practice for myself where I would write twice a week. And and I still do this. This is over 10 years later. This is like 12 or 14 years later. I am still writing twice a week except when life gets too intense and I have to prepare for a play or, you know, things like that. <laughs> so now I get to go back and write poetry twice a week. But, um, but what I decided to do was the feeling that creativity does not come in a vacuum. It is part of the larger universe. And so, and, and I don't really know where I came up with this concept or the concept just came into me. But when I wake up on Tuesday and Friday mornings, I invite poets, the um, spirits of dead poets, to sit with me. And so I have, it kind of changes, but the current one that has been with me for quite a while now is Dr. Maya Angelou. Uh, Angelis Arian, who's not a poet, but was a spiritual teacher. Uh, uh, John O'Donoghue, Rumi, Rilke, uh, Seamus Haney, mostly because I like the sound of his name. And he died during the time I was at MP5. <laughs> so he joined us. Sorry, James, but I love you there. Um, uh, and then I, I had some of my living uh, poets that I w- would love, which would be uh, Mary Oliver and, and David White. And then Mary Oliver had to step over into the other side. So she was joined by her and Edna St. Vincent Millay. And without me even knowing it, uh, it was. Uh, um, uh, Marie Oliver, who researched, who, who gathered Edna St. Vincent Millay's poetry when she was, when she passed, uh, uh, Mary Oliver was, was, uh, went in and, and collected and, and sort through all her poems. So they have an intimate connection, and now it's even more intimate. And, uh, and so anyway, so I, I, I welcome these spirits, and I don't see them as their visual, uh, who they were in life. I just, say, welcome, Dr. Maya Angelou, and mm-hmm. this and this, and I go through it, and welcome each. And did I mention Rumi and Rilke? They've always been part of that, too. And and then I I take a book, a, a, usually a spiritually oriented book, and I read until some phrase gives me the chills, and then I start writing. Mm-hmm. And And... One of the earliest books I, I came across, and I started this in 2007, and so it might have been 2008, I, was, I, I came across um, Bill Plotkin's book, Nature and the Human Soul. And so he's a depth psychologist, and this is really how I got into depth psychology, was through Bill Plotkin. And it's a 450-page book, and I'm reading only two pages or so mm-hmm. every session, and it took me four and a half years to read this book, and thousands of poems later, I really don't know how many poems, but but I just wrote twice twice a week. And this book has a lot of those poems that were inspired by Bill Plotkin. Uh-huh. And it's going, it, it, it's the circle of life, and he's starting with, with uh, birth and, 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 and where you are in there, and you're not always in the chronological place. But then it continues into, uh, and he has great titles for like the, um, something in the garden, uh, I, f- I forget it, and, and, and he has names for all these different parts and, and the older older people and, and a- approaching death. So my book, my, my poems had been, let me see if I could come across one that, that's obvious. But so this first book 
has poems that were inspired. Oh, here's one. Uh, he was talking about um, being an apprentice and, and then growing out of the apprentice the apprenticeship phase. So it's called Next Phase. The endless days of opening on silent ground that cannot be felt called to me. It is time to leave my small world of comfort. The truth of my existence is here, now, ready to take me on her flight of surrender. Surrender to who I am and resist no more. Surrender to faith, to healing power, to love. Surrender to the one life I am here to be, I am here to live. The apprenticeship is over. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nice. I'll read that again. Next phase. Yes, please. The endless days of opening on si of openings on silent ground that cannot be felt call to me. It is time to leave my small world of comfort. The truth of my existence is here, now, ready to take me on her flight of surrender. Surrender to who I am and resist no more. Surrender to faith, to healing power, to love. Surrender to the one life I am here to live. The apprenticeship is over. Nice. Very nice. Thank you. So when I started writing these poems, in, um, so a little bit about training. So I am a trained calligrapher, and I didn't want to go into poetry to start studying it and, and learn a certain way to do it, and then, you know, whatever, and then have to break out of that and kind of find my own path. I just decided to find my own path. Because yeah. I didn't care if they were, if society thought they were good poems or not poems, if I got accepted into poetry contests or what, or even if a book got published, because by that time, I knew I could self-publish. So there was no one over me saying I had to write a poem a certain way. So I was able to just go with this, and, and my skill grew just in the practice of doing it. And um, so, yes, untrained. Uh, I was going to go to something else. But, oh, the poetry, the, the, paint, the painting. Mm -hmm. So... An artist, especially if you're self-employed, it, it's really nice to have a project. Usually you you're either have jobs, commissions, something. But I found it really important to create my own project. And so in 2010, I had been writing these poems for a couple of years, and I, I had 37 poems I really, really liked. And I made it my project to start a blog, so that would put me out in the public. And the rule for the blog was every poem had to have a painting. Had to have a what? A painting. Mm -hmm. Oh, so mm -hmm. this is what got me really back. I hadn't been painting for about five years. I had didn't know what to paint, how to paint anymore. And I was in the transition from tr traditional Western calligraphy into abstract painting. So there was a time where I, I was trying to find my path in there. And so with this blog, I started doing very quick poems and very, very quick paintings. I wanted them to be as spontaneous as the poems because the poems come straight down from the top to the bottom very often with very little editing. And, and and not come in the way of channels, but come in the way of I have to meet you halfway. And that's been my practice, is to meet the other halfway. And and so I started doing these, these paintings, and then the paintings were quick, and then I kind of looked through my drawers for all the old paintings to see what they what would go with the poems. And then I ran out of those, and then the real work had to start, because I was writing more poems, and I had to start doing paintings. So I started doing a painting for each poem, and, and planning the painting around the poem, and really um, experiencing the, the joining of two disciplines in one body. And I, I make this joke sort of like, um, the two disciplines keep each other on the path. It's like as one gets better, the other has to get better, and they keep, oh, wonderful. keep the, <laughs> the process growing. So that's been my process of, of writing, a, a, a doing a painting for a poem, or sometimes now, I sometimes the painting might come first and the poem might come second, mm -hmm. or sometimes they happen in the same week, and it's like, wow, that's amazing, these go together. <laughs> and so then I will read the poem to the painting to see if it does work, and if I get the chills, it's like, yes, this works. So 
So it, it's been an amazing journey to, to work on both of those. So that's, that answers the question of how do you know when it's done? The poem, how do you know when it's done? The painting, you feel it. You feel it. You feel it. When I'm doing it. You know it, that it's right. Yeah, and when I'm doing a painting, uh, it comes to, are there any more questions? Mm -hmm. Should I do that? Should I try that? What if, you know? And when those, all those questions subside, it's like, wow, mm -hmm. this one's done. That was also Rilke's advice in Letters to the Young Poet. Uh, he's writing to Franz Kafka's. You know, why, are you, why do you keep sending your poems off to editors to see if they're any good? You know, the only person who knows whether this is a good poem or not is you. And same I think that's part of uh, what Bob is talking about when he's talking about we all have an aesthetic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We all have an aesthetic, and you know when mm -hmm. it's done. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Or it yeah, needs a little was, something there. When I was putting this book together, I had 24 poems. And as I read through it, I, and there's a flow at the beginning and the middle and the end, but there were, there were these two points that it just blocked. It just, I realized I had to take those two poems out. What I'm noticing about your book, though, is you know, looking over your shoulder and you're reading, is that this one, you have the poems, you have the paintings, but in your book, you actually brought all three of your poems together. Because yes. You, you put calligraphy in there. Well. Yes, I did. So, um, and the calligraphy, I'm trying to find a page where it will really show. Mm -hmm. So I have. The calligraphy is the, the title of the poems up the side of the page. I mean, I, all the paintings are also calligraphic, you know, but, but this here is, is the title of the poem. And it was the hardest part of the book to do. I, I had all the poems already, I had all the paintings, and it was like, all right, this stuff doesn't just come. It's like, I lettered every poem title like many, many times, and since I'm also good in Photoshop, sometimes it's like, that he looks great, and that one looks great, and I put it together and tweaked it, and, and so it was a lot of work to get the, the, the yeah. calligraphy done, partly because my eye is so good and I know what I want it to look like, and, well, the hand's pretty good, but sometimes it's not as precise as, as, the eye, as my eye is, so, uh, yeah. Sherry, so, yeah. You mentioned a moment, I think, if I heard you correctly, when you, you stopped writing um, a, as a younger person mm -hmm. and then maybe also put your paints away for a while. What was it in your life that made you go off track? Or Well, the reason I stopped writing poetry is because I started dating a writer. Um, <laughs> competition well, or? Animus. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is. Um, it is. I didn't want the uh, criticism. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, and he wasn't a poet. He taught me about poetry, but he wasn't a poet. I mean, my life also took a different turn. I went back to the land and, and w w with, this, with this man, 13 years, and, and we, I am from New York City, and we uh, had uh, bought three acres in upstate New York and, and homestead. We, uh, we built our own homes. We, we uh, raised most, most of our food. Life really changed. And I didn't have time for the poetry, but it, it no, the, the real reason was it was, uh, he was a former, prof a writing professor, and it was like, no, I'm not getting, I'm not going down that path. <laughs> you know, he doesn't know much about art, I can do art. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, we, we actually ran a festival for, um, for nine summers in upstate New York on Back to the Land Skills. From 19, the, the festival was from 1979, I think, through 86. And we'd have two or three hundred people come to our land. I mean, this was, I, I, when Tim Skip said, you know, they want to run the small conference, it's like, I know what a conference yes. is. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, we did that. And we also published a magazine called Homesteaders News on Back to the Land Skills. And we did that for nine summers, nine years. And I hand lettered it. That's also how I got rid of the calligraphy. And uh, so life, life changed then. The other time when I stopped painting, well, maybe when I was, you know, see, men have been not so good for me in my life, except for this one. Oh. It encourages it. Um, but the other time, I was married to a, a man, and I was living in Silicon Valley, and, and uh, he had uh, 
um, I, I started going from living with a dirt floor, literally, to uh, living in Silicon Valley. And, um, you know, he worked for, for Bill Gates, you know, so I hopped off with all those people. And, and, and the lifeblood, my, my particular lifeblood got drained out of me. There was nothing left in me. I had to uh, take care of so many things and do things that were fascinating, but wasn't my life. And you can't paint or do art when you're not living your life. Right. And that's really what happened. I had nothing more to say. Yeah. So uh, it wasn't until I left him and um, kind of got resituated that I could paint again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think for myself too. I've, I've been with partners who are just super critical, uh, maybe jealous. I don't know, but just constantly telling me, "No, that's no good. You know, you're not an artist." Or it's crazy. perhaps it's crazy. worse yet, someone who just was indifferent to it, mm -hmm. it didn't care. You know, mm -hmm. uh, had believed that there are people who are writers and artists, and that that's those people over there. Mm -hmm. I, I often think of Aristotle's uh, delineations of friendships. They're the friendships of utility and the friendships of essence, and it's the people of essence that you will stay with because mm. they get you and they they really see you and hear you. And which, again, it, as you said, it wasn't that those times in my life were barren. I mm -hmm. mean, I was accomplishing tremendous things in other ways, but I wasn't doing the soul work. I think there are there is this thing that happens in life. I think where you outgrow the thing that you're doing, um, the way that you write a poem, the way that you write a song, the way that you play a musical instrument, you, you get stuck. I think so, that's so true. Yeah, I can you see it in my art. For a while, or you, you have a teacher. You outgrow your teacher. You have a therapist. You outgrow your psychotherapist. I mean, that was always my goal. Both the people without for uh, uh, along those lines, and, and there are times you just simply have to put things down, and then amazingly, when you pick them up again, it's a different story. It's a different feeling. Uh, it's a whole different approach. It's like the Sleeping so Beauty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you go into yeah, yeah. It's like Sleeping Beauty. Mm -hmm. it actually, that's very well put. Yeah. What was she doing <laughs> during the time that she was asleep? Yeah. Well, we change, I think, when I try, it's always interesting when I, what kind of art do I do before a trip to Japan? And then I come back and it's like, let's see what it looks like now. Yes. You know, yes. Having done cool. that, let's see what it looks like now. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Mm. I wanted to give a couple of examples of how I use my reading. To write and and what what stirs me I'm currently reading well I'm reading beauty by uh, Donna Donahue and I'm reading this uh, amazing book that's been with me for several years now um, an almanac of the soul by Marv Hines and Marvin Nancy Hines Hiles Hiles H-I-L-E-S and it's it's a uh, uh, a calendar and, and it goes through a perpetual calendar kind of thing and you just read on, on your date and so a lot of my things are coming from there and I want you to read um, oh which one was that I'm sorry actually the one I was going to read was not, not from that one oh yes this one is it is for, from, from the phrase was and I don't know anything, and, and when I write, I write in, in a journal, I always put the date, I always put the reference book and the page number, and, uh, or if there's anything else that refers. So, so it sort of has been like a, um, uh, just something I've always kept record, I'm a good record keeper in a way. So I can always go back now and, and see, oh, what inspired that poem? And, and then in the book, I always underline it. So I, I, I could always go back to those phrases. So this one was called... Can I ask you a question first? Do you do it by hand? Everything's by hand. Yes. It is very rare, but that's not. Yeah. I sit in my bed, handwriting in my journal, and um, yes. 
This one's, uh, so this one was, was inspired by the words, spirit touching my bones. And, and I called this days. And, and, and sometimes the phrase might start a poem. In this case, it ended the poem. So I kind of knew where I was going with the poem without knowing how I would get there. I live inside the day. This boundary that separates one time from another, one sequence from the next. A framework giving form to the formless. One day piled on top of another, broken into minutes, hours, lives. The breath of the sky guiding me through dark, light, and dark again. But it's the fullness I'll remember. The breeze gushing into my lungs. The valleys, moon, stars. Feelings that cannot be contained the vast worldly otherness of spirit touching my bones. <laughs> this will be in my next book, which I'll be working on. I, I started working on it. So Would you read it one. again? Yeah. yeah. yeah I, like twice. I live inside the day, this boundary that separates one time from another, one sequence from the next, a framework giving form to the formless, one day piled on top of another, broken into minutes, hours, lives. The breath of the sky guiding me through dark, light, and dark again. But it's the fill it but it's the fullness I'll remember. The breeze gushing into my lungs, the valley, moons, stars, feelings that cannot be contained, the vast worldly otherness of spirit. Touching my bones. The, the reference from the, the book we were reading, what was that again? An Almanac for the Soul. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That is a good book. Yeah, it, it really is. A wonderful mm -hmm. collection. And I came across that book. I was in my uh, acupuncturist's office one day up in Hillsburg, and I walk in, or as I was leaving, there's this couple sitting there, and uh, she's he has my book in the office, and she's reading the book, and I'm looking at it, I say, oh, that's my book, and she goes, oh, here. I said, no, it's, I wrote it. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's pretty cool. And she said, well, she wrote a book, too, her and her husband, and, and I said, without even seeing it or knowing it, I know they were patients of this guy, so I knew it was going to be good. We exchanged books. Mm -hmm. and so nice. It was nice. Very sweet. Nice. Mm. Yeah. I, many of my poems are the same thing. There's a phrase that catches my imagination. Again, like I said, I, I often go to these traditional, older, classic stories. And what I've realized, too, is I'm, I'm a retired psychotherapist, but I'm still at work. Uh, there's things that I feel I want to say. I've had so many people come into my office and working on particular issues that I, that I felt needed to be addressed, and I find those things coming up in my poems. So this one, um, where this comes from, is uh, this is while I was putting together teaching my series on the Old Testament. You know, there are two different creation stories in Genesis. There's Genesis 1, which is the seven days, well, six days of creation plus a day of rest, two cycles of three. And then Genesis 2 and 3 is the Adam and Eve story, which is a completely different uh, creation story. Um, and, you know, there's this one tree that they can't access, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, the old Hebrews, this is something they did all the time, and Jungians will understand this very well. They would set up these pairs of opposites, uh, the tree of good and the tree of evil, uh, the, the knowledge of good and evil. Well, that setting up of op opposites to the Hebrews is what they call a mirrorism, which it doesn't mean good, it doesn't mean evil, it means everything in between. So basically, this is the tree all knowledge. And so Eve eats the apple. Adam, who's standing right next to her, eats the apple. And what do they realize? One thing, <laughs> that they're naked. And I, I just I struggle with this. Is that all knowledge? I mean, <laughs> they, 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 they cover themselves. You know, they, they hide. God comes seeking for them. And Adam, where are you? 
He says, oh, well, you know, we're here, but we were ashamed because we were naked. And God says, well, who told you that you were naked? Have you been eating of that tree? And mm. that phrase stuck in my head, who told you that you were naked? Um, and that's the title of my poem. Of all the words, all the things, of all the sounds one could have made, why this? Why this commentary on nakedness? That place of no control, of open truth, where someone could, yes, really hurt you? Who told you that you were naked? Who said that the blows and arrows would defeat you, could defeat you? Who said that? There was fruit today in our morning meal, and as knowledge arose, seeing difference for the first time, we somehow thought of faith. Beautiful. <laughs> Wonderful. Very nice. So, to me, this, this is about what we all do. It's the dawning of knowledge. Oh, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> and being ashamed. And, you know, the fig leaves. We hid our genitals with fig leaves. But I'll read it again. Who told you that you were naked? Of all the words, all the things, of all the sounds one could have made. Why this? Why this commentary on nakedness? That place of no control, of open truth, where someone could, yes, really hurt you. Who told you that you were naked? Who said the blows and the arrows would defeat you? Could defeat you? Who said that? There was fruit today in our morning meal, and as knowledge arose, seeing difference for the first time, we somehow thought of figs. <laughs> you know, in a funny way, it's it's a it's a mirroring of individuation from God. Yeah. <laughs> so I think yeah. that's what you're. Yeah. It's an my, essential story. My father always used to like to make a. A differentiation between knowledge of good and evil and knowledge that everything is possible. Yeah. I, mm. I kind of like that second way of saying it better. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 You know, who was it? I can't even remember who said this. Because if, if you look at that story, it's, you know, where, did you eat of that fruit? And Adam said, oh no, it was the woman. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Eve, did you eat it? Oh, no, it was the snake, you know. And <laughs> someone that I read somewhere said, no, how could the story have turned out differently if, if they had just said, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I know you told us not to. We did, and here we are. You know? <laughs> how could that story have been different if they just owned it? Mm. You know? That's the guide for couples therapy. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah, so true. Change your story. Yeah. Sometimes my poems are inspired by the news, and I went into a, a whole lot of poems uh, uh, after uh, Trump was elected. I, I actually had a show, and and I, I hadn't done any political poems, really, up until that point. And, and I didn't realize that that was what I was going to do for the show. And I ended up calling the show Caught in Time, uh, thinking that we're, we're in the time we were born, born into. And we're all caught in whatever time we're born into. And, and it was great to have a, a space and, and come up with, with new work. And one of the pieces I used, I had written this just a, a, a few days before my uh, a close friend of mine, her mother had passed. And this was also, I was in Jane Hirschfield's workshop when I wrote this poem. But it was during that, that time, I remember being in my room and my friend sent out a, an email about the, the passing of her mother who was in the Holocaust. And, and I wrote this poem called Caught in Time. 
It's not her story, but history. Numbers on her arm, a tattoo she never chose. Always the reminder of life taken from her. Mother, father, brother, gone. No home to return to. Only the promise she made to herself that someday she would have a family of her own to love. That was her answer. It was the only thing she knew that could not be taken from her, her desire to love. And as she passed away with her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren by her side, she knew she had won, and she thanked God for the living who carried forth the message to never forget. Mm. And that ties in with our play last night. I'll read that again. Caught in Time. It's not her story, but history. Numbers on her arm, a tattoo she never chose. Always the reminder of life taken from her. Mother, father, brother, gone. No home to return to. Only the promise she made to herself that someday she would have a family of her own to love. That was her answer. It was the only thing she knew that could not be taken from her, her desire to love. And as she passed away with her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren by her side, she knew she had won. And she thanked God for the living who carried forth the message to never forget. Did you write Did you write that before the um, play? Or after yeah, this was play? written in 2017. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Are all of these in that book? This will be in my new book. Bottom time will be in the new book. I was thinking when the play was unfolding that it was so difficult to watch the images in the back. And the fact that your beautiful, luminous, feminine form was on the stage somehow just kept reminding me of the potential for life to go on. Mm. It was really, mm. I can't tell you how much that, that your presence grounded it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, I agree. Mm. You know, we've all heard about these tattoos on the arm. It was apparently just the people that they knew at the start were going directly to Auschwitz who had those. Other people didn't have the tattoos on the arm. Um, but even with that story, it wasn't until actually studying, you know, I, I read Beck's biography, I watched the documentary about the Eichmann trial again, and then I saw the tattoo on the arm and I thought, oh my God, you remember last night I held up, you know, at to Ravenstock, we each received a transport number. Mm -hmm. That's what the tattoo was. It was their transport number. Oh, yeah. wow. They oh, already yeah. decided not to waste paper mm -hmm. oh, with God. the people that were going to Auschwitz. Really? Oh. That was just, that, I just oh. was flabbergasted. And I thought, wow, you know, that we need to understand what it was that happened. Mm. Yeah. That's a powerful poem. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah that will be in the forthcoming book for the painting. Have you chosen the painting yet? Yes, it's a painting that I had in the show. And have you seen the movie Arrival? Oh, yeah. It was um, uh, aliens talking in calligraphic mark making. I love um, that movie. And it's an amazing movie. <laughs> but it, So it's about the aliens and... The movie's great. <laughs> anyway, um, the movie is also about nonlinear time, and things keep going in and out of present, past, future, and that's where I got the title, was We're Caught in Time, and so my painting, and I, I, I have a, a video of the beginning of this painting, I'm doing it on the floor, it's on a huge piece of paper, and uh, 
And my, my concept for the painting was, was a circle, which is our life, being caught by these two kind of lines, and then another circle and being caught. So it was my, my response to that movie, to being caught in time. So everything kind of tied in together. And uh, so yeah, I, I do have that, that painting. In fact, for, for my book, I think I have all, all the paintings and, and poems ready. I'm just starting to put it together. And it's really exciting because I'm, the way I designed this book was that every page is, the layout is the same, which gives you a chance to really get, you know, forced into it and, and you, you get to know the pattern and then there's these subtle or not so subtle changes page by page. But this new one, I wanted to have the full painting in as much as I can, where most of those in here, many of the, the, the ones in here are cropped to fit the size. So I, it, it's a whole different layout journey and uh that's gotta be fun though. i think it's gonna be fun oh 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 yeah I've, I've, seen, Here's the I've seen some of the proofs for what she's doing and it's stunning yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. it's called okay. then the book is called remake reunited the 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 it's called then the book is called reuniting with beauty and uh this is inspired by john o'donohue's book beauty and i really feel at this time you know we need our creativity we need our art and we need beauty and so it's it's dedicated to beauty. And uh, I'll do a quick reading of that one as well. Yeah. yeah. Don's coming to me too. But, uh, and also on these prints, I always have the poem on the back too, as, as well as my cards. Reuniting with beauty. Morning is here. I awake to the newness of the day. I awake to the adventure it holds. Today, like every day, I have a chance to start over, to greet the sun, to smell the flowers, to bathe in nature and breathe her in. Today I smile with the universe. Today I accept the invitation that beauty brings. So I'll read that again. Reuniting with beauty. Morning is here. I awake to the newness of the day. I awake to the adventure it holds. Today, like every day, I have a chance to start over, to greet the sun, to smell the flowers, to bathe in nature and breathe her in. Today, I smile with the universe. Today, I accept the invitation that beauty brings. And I think it's nice to think about that as an invitation, like the flower is the invitation to stop. Mm -hmm. And greet the flower and have the flower greet us. We're all here now. Yeah. I mean, I feel that, uh, that looking upon it all. Is that painting all clinical? I mean, is it like just as bad, like really poor advanced? Oh, they're calligraphic strokes. There are no, in, in terms of calligraphy as meaning words, there are no words in the painting or in most of my paintings, maybe all the paintings these days. So, it was pretty no hard to have it upside down. So, I, I, I was, this is some acrylic gold paint in the back. I don't usually use acrylic, but I had some. And I did that. And then, with a piece of wood, and I think it is one of these pieces of balsa wood, but a bigger piece, I made these marks with white gesso, which is usually used as a primer for, for canvas mm -hmm. gesso. And then, I did everything, and I knew it needed something else, and what it needed was, was the calligraphic marks, or, or the, the grass, however you might want to see it. And so I practiced that a few times, and then just went ahead and, and did that. So. Okay. Yeah. Now, did you study painting as well? I do have a degree in, uh, a, a BA in, in studio art. Okay. I can't really say that I learned that much in my university. <laughs> In art, but um, I did study art. Uh, printmaking was, was what I loved the most. But I can't do any of that now because I'm chemically sensitive from running a printing press. So, <laughs> so it's easing up, but I still can't do that. I, I learned taking your classes, you know, for all of the art that I've studied in the past, I mean, it, again, it all had that feeling of it's over there. Those are the artists. Mm -hmm. But in your class, you know, it's like, you draw a line. You know? Oh, you do, and now, if you do that,
that line that you draw at the end of it. And I've actually painted some paintings in her class at the end of the art shows. You know, and I think I'm not a painter. Well, he got into an art show. I got rejected. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. But uh, it happens when I take her classes, and, uh, and I just take it to heart what mm-hmm. she teaches. And you really do teach how to do it. You mm-hmm. teach Oh, we've got amazing books. Yeah. I can't wait to, to see all of what you, yeah. you've all done. It's, it's going to be amazing. Yeah, I, I see the work around here, too. It's, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. What do you have next? Well, I thought that it would be uh, fun to uh, do the fifth Oh, slide. yes, that was delightful. <laughs> this, Talking about where things are inspired from. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this actually happened. Um, and this is Sherry and I are two of the characters. And uh, we are friends with my ex-wife uh, from Wisconsin, who's a PhD nurse, um, and her wife. She's married now to a woman, and uh, they wanted to come out to bouquets to art at the. Uh, uh, was that at the De Young? At the De Young, it's yeah. this amazing show that happens once a year. So they came out to visit us, and we spent this day driving big loop or out around through Napa Valley and. I got some wine and came back to the house and sat out on the back porch. And, you know, this is something that actually happened. So, the fifth glass. <laughs> this, after- <laughs> this afternoon, my ex-wife came to visit with her new wife. And we all set up a table on the back porch. We were having wine and cheese purchased on our long trip, a big loop locally. And we all somehow thought we were one wine glass sugar. When we talked about it later, we all agreed. Yes, they had told me to bring the glass out, and yes, I did, like we were one glass sugar. And yet, there were only four of us. In attentive silence, we examined that fifth glass, the one that all of us said was missing. (laughs) Then we clinked our glasses, And we shared that wine amongst ourselves. A good one from a Calistoga winery. And we all said, well, she's not here anyway. (laughs) That's great. That was just such a lovely moment. (laughs) Have you noticed the glass in the corner upside down? Uh, In the ceiling? (laughs) Yeah, I noticed it a while ago. Mm, I love it. So I'll, I'll go through it here. The fifth glass. This afternoon, my ex-wife came to visit with her new wife, and we all set up a table on the back porch. We were having wine and cheese purchased on our long trip, a big loop locally, and we all somehow thought we were one wine glass short. (laughs) When we talked about it later, we all agreed. Yes, they had told me to bring the glass out, and yes, I did, (laughs) like we were one glass short. And yet... There were only four of us. In attentive silence, we examined that fifth class, the one that all of us had said was missing, and then we clinked our glasses and shared that wine amongst ourselves, a good one from the Calistoga winery. And we all said, well, she's not here anyway. (laughs) That was a good day. That was a good day. We all got along great. Yeah. <laughs> Which is so civilized, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's just, I've certainly had the other experience, too. But, uh, it's so wonderful. I still have my family. You know? yeah. I still, the only thing that matters to her, the one thing that matters to my ex, is am I a father to her son? Mm-hmm. And yes, I am. Mm-hmm. And I have a relationship with him. He and I have traveled together. Um, that's, that's all that matters. Mm-hmm. If, I, if I'm that, then we are family. Mm-hmm. Nice. I'd like to read a poem by Pablo Neruda, uh, and it really speaks to what poetry has done in my life and what, what a change it made. And, and I, I just think he does this beautifully. It's called Poetry. And it was at that age, poetry arrived in search of me. I don't know. I don't know where it came from. From a river? 
from from winter or a river? I don't know how or when. No, they were not voices. They were not words. Not silence. But from a street, it called me from the branches of night, abruptly from the others, among raging fires or returning alone. There it was without a face, and it touched me. I didn't know what to say. My mouth had no way with names. My eyes were blind. Something knocked in my soul, fever or forgotten wings, and I made my own way, deciphering that fire, and I wrote that first faint line. Faint without substance, pure nonsense, pure wisdom of someone who knows nothing. And suddenly I saw the heavens unfastened and opened, planets palpitating plantations, the darkness perforated, riddled with arrows, fire, and flowers, the overpowering night, the universe. And I, tiny being, drunk with the great starry void, likeness, image of mystery, felt myself a pure part of the abyss. I wheeled with the stars. My heart broke loose with the wind. Mm. The metaphors are so wonderful. The, the wind as a metaphor mm -hmm. for what happens. But anyway, the metaphors are, that's what poets get to play with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We get to play with color. You get to play with right. metaphors. Yes. yes. Just a feeling saturated. Mm. I'll do another, another round of that one, too. Mm. Get that one in. Poetry by Pablo Neruda. And it was at that age, oh, great. poetry <laughs> arrived in search of me. I don't know. I don't know where it came from. From the winter or a river? I don't know how or when. No, they were not voices. They were not words. Not silence. But from a street it called me. From the branches of night. Abruptly from the others. Among raging fires or returning alone, there it was without a face, and it touched me. I didn't know what to say. My mouth had no way with names. My eyes were blind. Something knocked in my soul, fever or forgotten wings, and I made my own way, deciphering that fire. And I wrote the first faint line, faint without substance, Pure nonsense, pure wisdom of someone who knows nothing. And suddenly I saw the heavens unfastened and opened, planets, palpitating plantations, the darkness perforated, riddled with arrows, fire, and flowers, the overpowering night, the universe. And I, tiny being, drunk with the great starry void, likeness, image of mystery, felt myself a pure part of the abyss. I wheeled with the stars. My heart broke loose with the wind. It's so important for these, these people to open up those spaces in us. Mm -hmm. And then you recognize, yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> poetry arrived, and, and you've had that experience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a two two edged sword that I mean here's this opens up such a place in me and, and then there's another part of me that says, Wow, you know, words like this out there <laughs> do you really need mine? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it takes you to that place where you, know, you can write from that place yourself or, or paint or whatever it is that you do, sing or whatever. Um, this is you who never arrived. 
you, who never arrived in my arms, beloved, who were lost from the start, I don't even know what songs would please you. I have given up trying to recognize in you, in the surging wave of the next moment, all the immense images in me, the far off deeply felt landscape, cities, towers, and bridges, unsuspected turns in the path, and those powerful lands that were once pulsing with the life of the gods, all rise within me to mean you, who forever elude me. You, beloved, who are all the gardens I have ever gazed at, longing. An open window in a country house, and you almost stepped out, pensive, to meet me. Streets that I chanced upon, you had just walked down them and vanished. And sometimes in a shop, the mirrors were still dizzy with your presence and startled, gave back my too sudden image. Who knows? Maybe the same bird echoed through both of us yesterday, separate in the evening. You who never arrived in my arms, beloved, who were lost from the start, I don't even know what songs would please you. I have given up trying to recognize you in the surging wave of the next moment. All the immense images in me, the far off deeply felt landscape, cities, towers, and bridges, and unsuspected turns in the path, and those powerful lands that were once pulsing with the life of the gods, all rise within me to mean you, who forever elude me. You, beloved, who are all the gardens I have ever gazed at, longing. The open window in a country house, and you almost stepped out, pensive, to meet me. Streets that I chanced upon, you had just walked down them and vanished. And sometimes in a shop, the mirrors were still dizzy with your presence, and startled gave back my too sudden image. Who knows? Perhaps the same bird echoed through both of us yesterday, separate. human response to it. Mm -hmm. And we're just having it here, this asana. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. With a nod of the head, with that, that kind of truth. Yeah. Yeah. And then sometimes it does happen. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, does it? <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> That's precisely the one yes, I wanted to do. Yeah. This was Stephen Mitchell's translation. Uh, you know, this is a whole subject that's as 
countless articles written real pig in english and it's a thing because real pig reinvented the german language and i don't speak german but i understand you know he made up new words he put things in the wrong order and he just said things in a way that i had never said in the german language uh, prior to him uh, in english and it's very complicated but you know in english stephen mitchell has these very simple straightforward you know it's kind of similar in a way to the bible you know where you know each word the hebrews has a dozen different meanings you know and and in the english translations they just choose one and you get one reading of something that has a dozen or 20 different levels to it and yet stephen mitchell captures this beauty i think mm -hmm. Another person who actually did a really good job, Daniel Polakoff, and it's he's the one who's uh, wrote the, the biography. But this is his translation of the sonnets, and it's so lovely. Uh, I read to sometimes, and the poetry just just flows off the tongue. It's so so beautiful. Um, Polakoff, I know, does understand the complexity of the German, um, and tries to bring that. But yes, uh, Sherry's right. Uh, Rilke, uh, you know, this, this was a, a, a time of changes. It was the dawn of the truly modern age, but Rilke would have nothing to do with it. And he thought the modern age had stripped humanity of, of so much that was uh, of value. And Rilke was not an atheist. Uh, he, he believed in God, but he also felt Traditional Christianity had run its course, and that that it, that it was too small to contain modern man. And you know, that this was a long time ago. Modern age is long in the past. Uh, now, um, what period did he live? Um, he wrote in the late 1800s into the early 1900s. He died in the mid 1920s uh, from leukemia. But he always was on this search, and this is what he was trying, trying to break through to that experience, which I think he did, uh, finally, you know, particularly in the, uh, the elegies and in the sonnets to uh, Orpheus. Um, but uh, a, a class that I took online once uh, described Rilke, he said, you know, Rilke had this, it was almost like God was in the room next door. That, that's as close as he could get. And, and so that inspired me to write a poem, God in the Room Next Door. The deep thunder of your shuffling feet has kept me awake now for hours. You and your party animal, or your, your party angels, eating apples from Eden and drunk on gallons of ambrosia. The constant singing is driving me mad. <laughs> You and your heavenly chorus and all those long songs about what a great guy you are. <laughs> <laughs> songs that crash through every boundary made in a lifetime and every wall so carefully built, brick by brick. Every wall, that is, except the one that separates us now. You in your room and I in mine. The wall I pound on to get you to stop. Shut the fuck up. Turn the volume down. I'm trying to sleep, damn it. I can see now why you don't return my calls, <laughs> never send a text or reply to my long, lonely letters. I laugh with bitter tears at tales that God is dead. Dead drunk is what I would say. You and your friends, who don't include me, my fists beat against the rhythm, my voice hoarse. Are you deaf? That alone must certainly draw your attention, that muffled arrhythmia, my constant cries. But no, the angels come and go, the chorus like an ocean's surge, the walls fall one by one, except for this one, the one that separates us now. That's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Marvelous. Mm. <laughs> Somebody knew about texts in 1910.
God in the room next door. Okay. The deep thunder of your shuffling feet has kept me awake now for hours. You and your party angels, eating apples from Eden and drunk on gallons of ambrosia. The constant singing is driving me mad. You and your heavenly chorus and those long songs all about what a great guy you are. Songs that crash through every boundary made in a lifetime and every wall so carefully built, brick by brick. Every wall, that is, except the one that separates us now. You in your room and I in mine. The wall I pound on to get you to stop, shut the fuck up, and turn the volume down. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to sleep, damn it. See now why you don't return my calls, never send a text or reply to my long, lonely letters. I laugh with bitter tales, or bitter tears, the tales that God is dead. Dead drunk is what I would say. You and your friends, who don't include me. My fists beat against the rhythm, my voice hoarse. Are you deaf? That alone must certainly draw your attention, that muffled arrhythmia, my constant cries. But no, the angels come and go, the chorus like an ocean's surge, the walls fall one by one, except for this one, the one that separates us now. <laughs> that seems to me like a poem that um, happened all at once. Yes, yes. In fact, I, this is the one that I, you were talking about how they come. And I remember I was up late, I don't remember what I was doing, sitting at the computer, got up to go to bed, I was pushing the chair in, and there it was. Uh -huh. And I realized, if I go to bed, the poem won't be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I sat down and that this was the poem. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it pretty much came out mm -hmm. with just a word or two edited. Yeah. Just nice. like what you said. Mm -hmm. About yeah. how it came. Yeah. It's just now or never. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, there is something I've learned about poems when they they're they're like dreams. If you don't write them down right away, they go away. You you can catch them later. So mm -hmm. it's important to honor. That spirit as it comes through. Yeah. I, I don't think of it this way, but it's, it's a good way to say it that some people have said these, these things are floating or floating around, flying around, and if you don't catch it, someone else will. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to comment on what a treat it is to hear you both reading your own poems too, because mm -hmm. um, you know your own intonation that goes into your own voice. And it, it's, it, um, I remember also listening to recordings of T.S. Eliot, reading the Book of Cats and things like yeah. that, you know, um, there's just this whole other element when you hear the, the author read it. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. It's one of the things that I suggest in my book that you can have a copy is to develop your doodle so it becomes a work of your heart. That's what I was trying to do. Yeah, yeah. So this is made by us. Yes. Oh, thank you. God. Is that a drawing? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm just starting doing this. Today, I don't know why. It's kind of emerged yeah. from your imagination. Uh, yep. Hello? Everyone? We are not doing the Yellowstone. Yes. Oh, 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 oh the, gosh. Um, the whole park is closed. Wow. wow. Oh. And I'll give you a little taste of what's going on here. No. Wow. 
Oh, that's, that's disappointing. Um, they're evacuating all the visitors. Mm. Evacuating? Uh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Hmm. Oh, the, the bridges and, oh. and roads are out. Oh, they're flooding. Oh, wow. So, yeah. what we're going to do is we're going to take our trip. We're going to have a great time. We're going to keep our lodging reservations, and we will get to visit what I was hoping we'd get to do anyway, um, Virginia City, which is a beautiful historic ghost town. And that's not too far from West Yellowstone. And then we can go around sort of above where the danger is and go down to Paradise Valley, which is one of the most beautiful stretches of, of the state. And there's a wonderful hot springs there if you've got a swimming suit. And we can go soak, we can look at, we can take a hike. Uh, mm -hmm. There's some art galleries in, in uh, Livingston. So, what's this? What's that? It's just a swoop. You can get Lewis and Clark Caverns too. Yeah, Lewis and Clark Caverns. Yeah. yeah. So you were, yeah. you were saying about... I don't think the work is... I don't think the work is... This is the first to be in some of these yeah. lines that yeah. you know, show up yeah. over here. Okay. Yeah. Coming yeah. through yeah. the yeah. family. Yeah. 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 You have to weave it so that you bring the background. For mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. got you. Yeah. That's what I was, I was trying to... That's what I was going for. I was just trying to... Mm -hmm. She was... I saw her doing it and I was like, you know, I'm going to try to just... Yeah, that's what she's going with it. Doing it. You're letting this come out over here and then picks up over here. This comes through here, picks up over here. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, but it started to come through and show up across. And you incorporated the uh, water too, I believe. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So, anyway, that's a that's what I would suggest. You know, right now you yeah. I will, okay. Yeah. Yeah. This has been like a yeah. Yeah. project. Yeah. 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 Progress, you know. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's wonderful. I'm sorry, dude, if you weren't able to. You, you just, oh. I, I was comatose this morning. No, I didn't see it. But it'll be on tape. I hope it goes down. Did it go okay? Um, yes, Jeff. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. 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 Uh, uh, uh huh. Okay. okay.